I don't know anybody who doesn't love the moving of the Holy Ghost. I just don't know anybody. The Holy Ghost is a gentleman. I've seen people say, well, I don't like to act crazy and get all snotty and, and uh, shout like that. You, you know, you're all boisterous and loud. I'm not that kind of guy. I'm more to myself. I'm a collected individual. I want to tell you something. The Holy Ghost has no problem moving in you, and his power can move in you, and you don't have to act like me. Amen? I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that there's diversity in the body of Christ. Amen? And if the Holy Spirit knocks you down like he knocks me down, we'll praise the Lord. But if you're able to stand when he comes around, we'll praise the Lord anyway. Amen? Everybody loves it. One of the greatest things about our church and that people come into this church that they fall in love with is the moving of the Holy Spirit. They fall in love with that, the presence of God. That's what they fall in love with more than anything else. They want the moving of God. Because the Spirit of God brings a dynamic that you just can't have any other way. You can't have power flowing through the service without the moving of the Holy Ghost. He adds that right ingredient that makes the service dynamic, powerful, and impactful. You can't have a great move without the Holy Ghost today. Can I hear Pentecostal people? Can I get an amen there? You can't have a move of the Holy You can't have a great move today without the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is absolutely necessary. I know that in this church, we're Pentecostal through and through. So you're going to hear a lot about the Holy Ghost. But I don't want the Holy Ghost just to fall in our church. How many would like it if he fell in the Methodist church? How many would like it if he fell in the Presbyterian church? How many would like it if he fell in the Baptist church? Hallelujah. I'd love to hear some Baptist people full of the Holy Ghost. Amen. It would be awesome to see that. The Holy Ghost is not restricted to denomination. He is not restricted to place, time, or your little box of thinking. The Holy Ghost can move in and out and all around in any place. The Bible does not teach us denomination or that we put above our name Pentecostal that the Holy Ghost is for them. I could give you testimonies today of Baptist people full of the Holy Ghost. I can give you a testimony today of two Catholic people seeking for more of God and in a Catholic Mass were baptized with the Holy Ghost. Now, that's amazing. Now, they got kicked out of the Catholic Church, but, but that's another story, amen? But they got full of the Holy Ghost. We love the moving. We love, we love the stories of, of the glory clouds and the, and the altars filled and people weeping and crying and, and, and the shouting and the, and the running and the dancing and the shaking. Remember, they, they talked about the Quakers. The Quakers were people who, under the presence of God, would tremble and shake when God moved, and they called them Quakers. I, we love all of those things, but those things aren't as important. Those are just the way we react to the moving of the Holy Spirit. You know what's important? is how they got there. When I was a little kid, Brother Carnahan, these, these folks know Brother Carnahan, and Brother Carnahan made a statement he was preaching on the Holy Ghost. He said, you know, I've heard a lot of people say, we need to go back to the book of Acts. Will you, the book of Acts, we need the Holy Ghost of Acts. And Brother Carnahan stood up behind that pulpit. And I was just a little kid. It so impressed me as a little kid. He said, we don't need to go back to, to Acts. We need to go back to living the way the men lived in the book of Acts. That's how the Holy Ghost moved. And that's what I mean with this title. Forget the events. Forget the miracles. Get back to what caused those things to happen. Get back to the root base of why the Spirit of God moves. If you find yourself dry, then this message is for you. If you find yourself in a place where the Spirit of God hasn't been moving in your life like He's supposed to or He should be, then this message is for you because the cause of His moving is important in your life. Everybody wants to, the Holy Ghost to perform, but no one wants to pay the price for his performance. I'm going to say it again. Everyone wants the Holy Ghost to perform, but nobody wants to, to, pay, to pay the price for his performance. I remember when the Los Angeles Kings were going to the Stanley Cup. It was just a few years ago, and a little brother and I are Los Angeles Kings fans. And uh, I wanted to take my brother to the game, so I called for tickets, and I got online looking for tickets, and... When I saw the price of the nosebleed seats, I called my brother and said, you're watching it from your couch. Amen. 
You're just going to watch it from your couch. I can't afford to go to a Stanley Cup game. Not even the nosebleed seats were, were horrific and the price was astronomical. And I just wasn't willing to pay the price. Do you know that there are some Christians who want the Holy Ghost without the price tag? Without, the, without, the, without paying what's necessary to have that move. They have no problem with the move. They want the move. And that's why you see a lot of people who will travel places looking for a move instead of falling down and getting back to the cause of the move and having a move of their own. Amen? Stay with me tonight. Don't fall asleep. <laughs> the truth is, church, we need the Holy Ghost so bad that there should be no price we would not be willing to pay. What do I have to surrender, God, for you to move? For your Holy Ghost to move. The Holy Ghost equips and makes difficult situations a small thing. Lattle Creek, California. You come at the right night. I'm preaching on a lot of stuff you all know. Amen. Lattle Creek, California. When After a hard day of work, we had our own fill station. And we would play paintball almost all the time. And I remember Brother Jose, a good friend, uh, he... He didn't have a paintball gun, so I think Brother Michael here actually loaned him a pump gun, or Brother Deathridge loaned him a pump gun. And we all had semi-automatic weapons, okay? Well, basically, I could shoot anywhere between 10 to 20 balls a second with my gun. Everyone else could shoot very fast. They could shoot 5 to 10 balls a second. I mean, just boom, 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 boom like that. And here's Brother Jose. And one round of paintball, Brother Jose came back, from the paintball war, and he was covered in paint. I mean, he had just got pulverized. And Brother Jose said, this is why we lost the Alamo. Hey, man, he was from Mexico. <laughs> he was so funny, man. But you see, what it was is that he was ill-equipped for the battle at hand. I want you to know that the Holy Ghost is the right weapon for the right job. Amen. He's got the right ammunition to tackle the right problem, to solve the right issue. He's, it, it's like if you go out there without the Holy Ghost, it's like going out there amongst devils with a pump gun. Amen. We need that. We need the Holy Ghost who gives that semi-automatic uh, weaponry, who can, who can take tanks on, who can stand and, and face the giant without any complication because the Spirit of God is there. Amen. The baptism of the Holy Ghost has, is a wonderful promise, but how many know that God also has conditions upon the baptism of the Holy Ghost? I used to say there was no conditions for salvation until the Lord convicted me. There is conditions for salvation. There is. It's called repentance. Amen? That's the only condition for salvation. You must repent. Then salvation can come to you. You're not going to be saved any other way. There's also conditions to be filled with the Holy Ghost. For instance, God doesn't feel an unholy man. Are we here tonight? Should we do some spiritual calisthenics, do some jumping jacks or something? <laughs> Amen. It, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost has conditions. He does not feel unholy men. Hence the name Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost feels holy men for the holy purposes of God. Amen. The Holy Ghost has his conditions. And church, we have to, be, we have to come to a place to align ourselves with the conditions that the Holy Ghost might move in. These conditions that must be fulfilled, the apostles said, said very clearly, the Holy Ghost is given to them that obey God. I don't think it's any simpler than that. The Holy Ghost comes and falls on them that obey God. In obedience to God, the Holy Ghost falls. For a long time, I worked at the University of Redlands, and I seen many college sororities. They all had initiation rites. Some of the things I seen on a college campus are not good to tell you here. They were pretty grotesque, some of the things I seen. But some of the things I saw students do just so they could get into a sorority, like they wear PJs to, to class. They weren't allowed to shower for weeks. It was a, a, a horrible thing to walk by people who were who were in the process of coming, going into a sorority because they have these initiation rites. I want you to know that the Holy Ghost, just like a sorority, has initiation rites. 
Not that, and this, the sorority thing is a silly thing, but the Holy Ghost is a real thing. It's a real, a real thing that needs, to, that needs to be pushed and impacted into our lives that we will not let go of, but that we'll hold on to even harder and deeper than ever before. The Holy Ghost, I've seen students doing crazy things in order to fit in. Church, how much more should you and I, in the eyes of God, be so committed to God that the world deem us crazy for what we want in God? Amen? For what we want in God. Amen? I've examined and studied many lives and many men who have been filled, who have experienced the infilling of the Holy Ghost. And there's one overwhelming factor to why men are filled with the Holy Ghost. Are you ready? I'm going to give it to you. One thing. Consecration. Consecration. That's a deep holiness word. Consecration. It literally means dedicated for a sacred purpose. It means committed to God. It means obedience to God. That's what it means. Consecrated men. The Holy Ghost fell on consecrated men. God doesn't need wealthy men. He needs Holy Ghost filled men. God doesn't need talented men. He needs Holy Ghost filled men. God doesn't need the best out there who could do the job or know how to do the job. He just needs somebody full of the Holy Ghost to step up and say, yes, Lord, I will do it. Amen. Philip Brooks put it this way. It does not take great men to do great things. It only takes consecrated men. That's all it takes. God's looking for men that are willing to say, God, I love you more than I love this world. God, I love you more than I love anything that this world can even ever, or ever, ever offer me. God, I give it all to you. I'm consecrated for your purpose and for your plan and for your will. God, use me. Use me, God. If there's a call that our church is called to, it is simply this. God wants you to be consecrated to him. That's what God wants, you to be consecrated unto him. What does it look like when a man is consecrated to God? What does it look like when a man is consecrated unto God? One, their obedience. They obey God. Consecrated people are obedient people. They obey the commands of the Lord. Jesus said, if you love me, obey my commandments. That's a pretty simple statement, isn't it? If you love me, then obey my commandments. In other words, I will know you love me because you do what I say. I want to say that again, especially in today's world with this grace happy message. In other words, I will know you love me because you do what I say. You know, a lot, well, I better hold on to that. I'll, I'll, I'll go off on a tangent, amen? <laughs> I don't want to do that tonight. Obedience tells God this, I, you can be trusted. Obedience tells God you can be trusted. You see, the God has all, everybody does this to God. God, uh, God loves you and, and therefore that's all that matters. That's wonderful, but what about your love for God? Amen. What about your love for God? I'm thankful that God loves me. He loves me. I know he does. He loves me even without conditions. He doesn't love me if. He doesn't love me when. He simply loves me. But now it's my turn to love him. I love him because he first loved me. Amen. I love him because he first loved me. And in my love for him, I find this desire to obey the word of God, to do what Jesus said to do, to live how he said to live, to be holy and consecrated for the purposes of God, that the Holy Spirit can flow through me to this lost world. Amen? We don't give privileges to kids who don't earn them. For the longest time, I wouldn't let my kids stay home alone. I couldn't trust them to stay home alone. I couldn't trust them to be in a bedroom alone, let alone stay home alone. Amen? There are certain, certain levels of trust that come 
because of obedience. And as we obey God, the trust level rises and God's able to give you more and to give you more and to give you more and to put upon you more responsibility. But until you get to that place where God can trust you, we say all the time, trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. He shall direct your path. But wait a minute, what about our trust? Why can God trust us? That after he fills us or, or pours into us his glorious gift of the Holy Spirit, we're not going to walk out those doors and become unconsecrated unto the holy God that we serve. Amen? God doesn't give his precious gift of the Holy Ghost to those who cannot be trusted with it. Because it is so sacred. They were obedient people. Not only were they obedient people, they were dedicated Consecrated people are dedicated to God. Dedicated for His purpose. Dedicated so that they can fulfill His will, His purpose. In our lives, we can be dedicated to a lot of stuff. Some people are so dedicated to their job that they could even miss God. Amen? Some people are so dedicated to, uh, to a video game that they don't even go to church. I know adults like that. I know adults that won't even get a job because of video games. <laughs> and that's pretty sad. But it, but it is true today. It's a, it's an, it's a serious epidemic today. There's, there's a level of dedication that can take you from God. Then there's a dedication that will make you run to God. That will make you pour into the Lord. That will make you run hard after the Lord. We have to be careful where our dedication lies. Because it can be, the, the glory of God can be stolen by our lack of dedication. The vessels in the tabernacle and the temple were dedicated for God's use. They weren't used to throw parties with. You didn't use the, the glorious dedicated vessels of God to throw a party. Belshazzar did that. Belshazzar took the vessels of God, the holy vessels of God, and he took the dedicated things that were dedicated for the purpose of God, and he poured ungodly drink in them, and he threw a party, and he thought everything was all right. He did not realize that his kingdom, that was the last night he would ever be asleep in a peaceful kingdom for him. Because he desecrated what God meant for dedication unto himself. God doesn't want us to desecrate what he has dedicated. The Bible says, know ye not, you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And that means you, are, you have been dedicated for a sacred purpose, consecrated unto the Holy God. And in that consecration and in that dedication, don't allow yourself to desecrate the temple of God. Amen? The act of consecrating the vessels of the temple or tabernacle means that they were dedicated for God's purpose. Ask yourself this, are you dedicated for God's purpose? Does his purpose mean everything? If you want the Holy Ghost, you got to be dedicated. I said if you want the Holy Ghost, you got to be dedicated. You must belong to God. You must be his and his alone. God doesn't pour the Holy Ghost in vessels who are dedicated to worldly things and godly things. Hear me again. The Holy Ghost doesn't fall on people who are dedicated to holy things and unholy things. In other words, you can't have one foot in and one foot out and expect the power of the Holy Ghost to really fall upon you. You can't expect that. We can't have a book of Acts experience with that kind of mentality and that kind of lifestyle. We have to obey God. We have to be dedicated unto God. When Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the Lord, the Lord said, Whom shall I send? Isaiah said, Lord, send me. In other words, here I am, Lord. I'm dedicated for you. I'm the one you can speak through. I'm the vessel that you can fill with your word. I'm the one. Church, we've got to come to that realization that we are the ones that God wants to fill. So let's let him fill us. When King Asa heard the, word, the words of the prophet Azariah and turned wholeheartedly to the Lord, he began to consecrate Israel back to the Lord. 
And the scripture says he brought the dedicated vessels back to the Lord. Second Chronicles 15, 18 records these words. And he brought into the house of God the things that his father had dedicated and that he himself had dedicated silver and gold and vessels unto God. Church, until you bring your vessel to God for dedication, the Holy Ghost will not fall. When the altar calls given and you sit on the pew and watch someone else get in, it isn't going to happen. Come on now, I'm preaching tonight. Amen? We have to be dedicated. We have to be purposefully seeking. We have to get in there. Even if you don't feel it, get in there. Even if you don't want to, get in there. Even though it's hard, get in there. Even though you have problems, get in there. Even though you're in a trial, get in there. Even though you're in a valley, get in there. Even though the family's going crazy, get in there. Never allow yourself to not get in there. Amen? They were, not only, they were not only obedient to God, consecrated men were obedient to God. Not only were they dedicated to God, but they were committed, committed unto God. Dedicated, committed unto God. You know what the funny thing is about a living sacrifice? It loves to crawl off the altar. Amen. <laughs> Some of you got it. <laughs> the funny thing about a living sacrifice is it loves to crawl off the altar. You know what keeps the sacrifice on the altar? Commitment. I said commitment. Commitment keeps the sacrifice on the altar. It keeps the fire burning. When everything else is difficult and, and, you know, there's a lot of people who make that real quick uh, initiate, uh, initiation or that real quick mind. They make up their mind at that moment that they're really going to get in there. They're really going to get on fire. And then they walk outside the doors and they forgot to take commitment with them. Because they get out the doors and the commitment's gone. It's not there anymore. And then they lose that feeling that drew them to be dedicated and to obey God. How many have ever lost that feeling? Oh, no one's being honest in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. Come to church and you felt something good, the Holy Ghost touched you, blessed you, and then you went outside and you met someone that, that didn't like you. Had some evil to say to you. That one family member that always gets under on your nerves calls. Right? Someone who's got a problem calls. Some issue arises. There's always something that has a way of stopping the sacrifice from really transpiring. For the living sacrifice to stay there, it must take commitment to do it. You can come down here with a, a holy rush and a holy move of the Holy Ghost and feel some great move and have a little tingle in your heart and give a little, have a little shout and have a, have a spring in your step. But if commitment's not there on Monday morning, every devil in hell is going to be right there to stop you. And so commitment puts the sacrifice back back on the altar and says, no, I'm not letting go of what I got from the Lord. Amen. Seasoned saints, maybe it's been a while since the Holy Ghost fell on you. You know, the danger, the danger of, of many things is familiar, being familiar with it, becoming familiar with it. Some people are so familiar with the Holy Ghost, they just know how it goes. I've seen kids mimic what their parents do. I've seen, I, I, I have literally seen reenactments of old moves because it's by familiar territory. I don't want to become familiar with what once was. I want to be experiencing it right now. In my heart, in my life, I want the power of the Holy Ghost to be flowing through me. I don't want to live off a past experience either. 
I want to praise the Lord for the time he filled me in the Holy Ghost with the Holy Ghost in my bedroom. Oh, it was good. Can I get, amen? Was it good for you too? Don't act, I'm wondering because everyone's kind of looking at me intently. I don't know if you got it or you haven't got it yet or not. It, the, the, the Holy Ghost is so wonderful. When I first got filled, I was, oh, oh. I never love people like I love people now. I mean, it's, oh, man. Even those people I didn't like, somehow I loved them. I, oh, man, it was good. Right? I hope, and it, God, the Holy Ghost is just wonderful. It's like a, 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 a it's the, the word dynamite is exactly what it means. It's just an explosion of love and power in your heart. I mean, it's just amazing. It's amazing. I don't want to live there, though. Praise God for yesterday. And I'll testify all day and all night about what he did yesterday. But, oh, I need a move of God today. I need the Holy Ghost today. I need a fresh touch today. I need a renewal. I need a refreshing. You see what the Holy Ghost is all about? He pours it in so you can pour it out. Amen? Has your tank ever been empty? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Have you ever been drained spiritually? When you come to the house of God and everybody's praising the Lord and all you're doing is raising your hands and acting. Right? You don't want anyone to think you're not saved, so you put your hand up and you give the pious look. Right? Come on now, guys. Be real. Be real. Church, the Holy Ghost falls on those people who are done living off yesterday and are still committed today to what they had yesterday. The Holy Ghost was not for just the book of Acts. It's for me too. The Bible says it's for all them afar off. It's for them that obey God. I want the Holy Ghost right now. Rend the heavens and come down, Holy Ghost. Fall in here, Holy Ghost. When people drive by, let the Holy Spirit and conviction power draw them into the house of the Lord. Amen? Give him praise. He deserves it. I remember sitting and listening to David Wilkerson. He talked about the popularity that came with the cross and the switchblade and, and all the stuff that transpired through Teen Challenge and how it began to explode. One of the things he said is he got so busy, so busy, that he lost his time with God. He said he got out of the prayer closet. Wasn't that he wasn't praying? And that he wasn't saying, oh, Lord, I need you. He said, I just got out of the prayer closet. He said, I wasn't praying like I should. Then he said, I got out of the word. I started reading other books because he wasn't an educated guy. He said he never went to Bible college, never received a degree. And so he felt like he needed more education. So he began to study other books. And so doing that, it brought him out of the word of God. And it stole from him the anointing. He testified one time that he was standing up behind a pulpit amongst 5,000 teenagers. And he said he preached the most horrible message he could ever preach. He preached on marriage to a bunch of drug addicts. He said he missed God entirely, and when he left that place, he went into the, his, his, uh, his little room uh, in, in, his, in his fifth wheel, and he, he just shut the door and said, I don't want to be bothered. He knew that he, was, he wasn't in the right place. He testified about this with his own mouth, because we all find our place, and we all find times in our life where we were once there, and sometimes we can drop. But how many know we don't have to drop? 
How many know we don't have to go down? And David Wilkerson got a book from Leonard Ravenhill thrown to him. It was called uh, Christian in Complete Armor by William Gurnall. And he read that book and the Holy Spirit struck him. And he said, Lord, you know what? I'm coming back to what I know works. And he recommitted himself to the Word of God. He recommitted himself to prayer. And when he did that, the anointing came back and all the power began to flow again. Church, how many know if you recommit right now, the power will come back to your life? I said it will come back to your life. God has not taken it and said you can't have it back. Your God is not like that. He does not repent in what he gives to you. He wants to give it to you. Paul was committed to preaching the gospel. Commitment will endure affliction. When your flesh won't, commitment will. I said, when your flesh won't, commitment will. You'll endure it. Commitment will, ha the reason why some of you are still saved today is because your commitment kicked in. Right? Right? You, you were having a rough time and you were at the brink of the end and, and the devil's telling you to quit and, and the flesh is tired and, and you were even thinking it. But somehow, something inside you said, no, you can't quit right now. And because you that, the commitment level rose up and it got you to go one more step. And after you took that one step, it was easier to take the next step. And after you took that one, you got further and further away from the trouble that you left behind. And commitment does that. Commitment will bring you through some difficult stuff. Jim Elliott said this. Let me read what he said. He said, Whatever, wherever you are, be all there. I like that. Wherever you are, be all there. In your service to God, be all there. In your dedication to God, be all there. In your obedience to God, be all there. It really is just that simple. And once you take those steps, those initiation rites, if you will, take those steps to getting where you know you should be with the Lord, Oh, the fire that will fall. Oh, the fire that will fall. But it's all required, one thing required, consecration unto God. Consecration. Let me conclude with this. The act where one consecrates himself is defined by his or her obedience, dedication, and commitment. Jesus himself expressed this in his life to us. He was obedient to the cross. How many know he didn't have to go? God said, that's the way. Go. And he obeyed it. He was obedient to the cross. How many know he was dedicated to be our propitiation? He was dedicated to make sure you could be forgiven. We sing that song, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. He was dedicated for that purpose. His sole purpose in living was that you might have salvation. That's dedication. He was dedicated to be the vessel to which God poured out his wrath upon. And he allowed it to happen. He was committed to your redemption. That's consecration. Church, we need the Holy Ghost more than ever before. But we need him just like the people the book of Acts had him. We can't look at what others are getting and say, oh, look, they got revival, so let's pack up and move down there because revival's down there. As if the Holy Spirit is limited to one place. He is not. 
Now, I don't want to diminish what God was doing in in Pensacola, and I don't want to diminish what God did in Azusa because he did mighty things, and people traveled from all over the world and came there and experienced God in a real way, and they took revival back with them. I don't want to diminish that, but I do want to elevate this thought in your mind. We have as much of the Holy Ghost as we have committed ourselves to receive. That's the truth. And if we want more, I said, if you want more, you can have it. Pull yourself up to the table and say, Father, here I am, ready to feast on what you have for me. Feed me, Lord. Feed me what you will. Take out what you want. Take out what you want. Amen? Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word tonight. God, we need you so desperately. We need the Holy Ghost. We need the Holy Ghost. Lord, we can't do it with just our own strength. It's not by our might, but it's by your Spirit. Father, I pray that that this church would be a Pentecostal church through and through. That your Holy Spirit would take residence here. That God, you could bring whomever you want in this building and we will preach the truth. Stand upon the truth. Declare the truth. Father, right now I pray for a mighty move. A mighty move. Bring us back, bring us back, oh God, to that place of consecration. To that place where we enjoyed being where you are. Where we enjoy being in your house. Where we enjoy the shout, where we enjoy the praise. Father, pour out like never before. Give us a fresh touch. In Jesus' name, amen. If anybody needs prayer tonight, I want to pray for you.